show of tales from the forlorn dopes i'm your host cyber smiley i am your co-host wisdom greetings programs we have a we have a good show for you today we have uh our special guest is uh uh mac martin from monster fight club um he's gonna yeah he's joining us to uh talk over the game um let us know what's new going on with the uh newest two expansions for edge runner and vehicles and we're very excited to have him here very excited to be here awesome so first thing we do uh with all our guests is we have a a, a questionnaire call it the full auto questionnaire so it's short quick answers with short quick question or uh, short quick questions with short quick answers um there are no wrong answers but one of them might not be right in in my opinion but anyways let's get started uh 2013 2020 2045 or 2077 i'm a 2045 guy okay favorite cyberpunk role solo i know it's so predictable i really (laughs) like the solo favorite I mean, what's not to like yeah they get things done you know so, and and not just from a player perspective the solos in my campaign have always been some of the most fun characters my wife has one named dos eddies who <laughs> is just hilarious she's a bargain basement assassin <laughs> moving she along. doesn't do it for the money she does it for the love of the game all right, so favorite piece of cyberware? Cyberfinger microphone. Favorite cyberpunk weapon? Cyberfinger microphone. <laughs> favorite cyberpunk red or 2020 book? Ooh, Black Chrome is one of my favorites. I like any of the books that are written, you know, like in world shopping. Uh, and I think Black Chrome is maybe one of the best written books that does that. Excellent. Least favorite yeah. cyberpunk book, read or 2020 book? Man, there was one in red uh, in 2020. Um, I can't remember the name of one of the. It wasn't so much of an adventure, like, but it was more of a collection of screen sheets. I can't remember what it was, what it, the name of it was, but I lost a net runner. I really was enjoying to that 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 book, and so I've always had a, a, a bad taste in my mouth to it. I wish I could remember its name so that I could I could say it and then spit. Ray, Rach Bartmos's <laughs> guide to the net. Huh? Rach Rach Bartmos's guide to the net. That might have been it. Oh, I love that. That might have been. Yeah, yeah, I, I had a net, uh, we were running, I think that one's got a scenario where there's a thing in an apartment with an explosion, uh, and I definitely was not in the right place with that bomb. Ooh. Um, so, next question, uh, favorite Night City Gang? Ooh, um, do I have to pick an era? Nope. No. no. Pick again. Oh, okay. If I have to just pick one, it's probably Maelstrom, simply because from 2077 to 2045, they always look so alien. They also look quintessentially cyberpunk, and there's just something about that like open face, multi eye appearance that is that CD Projekt Red has done so much with, but that the uh, you know original kind of I don't know. I love I love how alien that that weird eye mask. I don't know what it's called. 
I'm sure it has an official name. Just then. some kind of optic mount. I, yeah. I don't know. It's it's a weird. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, the I mean, mount is it will haunt me at night. <laughs> Favorite mega corporation. Gonna... Gotta move on. Quick answers. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> So, favorite uh, mega corporation? Uh, ooh, all foods. Yeah. Well, I guess they're not. Maybe I don't know if they count as mega. Corporation, they are a mega but... corporation, I believe. Okay. I mean, they count. Uh, so next is Pan Am, Judy, or Rogue? Pan Am. Uh, Kerry, River, or Garu? I don't know if I remember River well enough. That was the cop, right? Yes. Yeah, River was the, the cop. And then Goro was the... Oh, yeah, Goro. Definitely Goro. Yeah. Um, did you, did it's you play... Zaddy in it. Zaddy energy. Come on. <laughs> did you play uh, uh, Phantom Liberty so at all? Huh? Did you play Phantom Liberty at all? Yes. Uh, okay. I've got a, I got a chance to play through it once... But I wasn't able to give it multiple playthroughs because I, I had a lot of work That's to fine. at the time. But I wasn't able to 100% at once. So the next question is Songbird or Reed? I went Songbird. Okay. Which ending because, did... Oh, frankly, it was raining. And if I don't get to end that by fighting Idris Ilba in the rain, are we even <laughs> yeah. in the 80s like we should? Okay. Which like ending that, was that, your that, favorite? That, or did you, Or did you only get one? ending i haven't got a chance to go through and actually see the second ending okay um so the one you like is the one where you and johnny take on the uh yeah. air socket oh, oh of all the of all the standard endings, my favorite is the one where you and johnny decide to not go on the mission because you're risking too many too many lives and you're not worth it yep I, okay i that ending that ending just stuck me oh man it shook me for days <laughs> next question uh this is from the air journal anime uh lucy rebecca or kiwi i mean of them everyone loves rebecca how, is, how do you not like rebecca like, <laughs> next one rebecca uh, has okay. the, just the best arc too sorry <laughs> david main or pillar pillar uh smasher or faraday I'm going to say Faraday simply because I don't know what his stats are yet. Okay. Favorite cyberpunk red combat zone faction? Oh, from ours? Yeah. Uh, I'm partial to the zoners simply because I love the ski mask, but I I personally play edge runners uh, because they have so many mercs, and it means that if I accidentally make them too good or too bad, they both, you know, th there's a solution to it. I'm not going to subconsciously make them too powerful. Okay. <laughs> Favorite cyberpunk movie, anime, or TV series? If we're just talking about the genre as a whole. I yes. go back to Strange Days with Ray Fiennes and Angela. Oh Pazza. yes. I mean, you also have all the Johnny Mnemonic and uh, I don't know. Maybe Tank Girl even counts as almost cyberpunk, but not. Yeah. It's, it's definitely cyberpunk adjacent. It's at cyberpunk adjacent, but if I have to pick, Strange Days is it's it. It's so cyberpunk with the serial number shaved off. You know, it's such a 80s back alley bootleg, and I love it. Yeah. That or maybe yeah. what was the Pam Anderson one, Barbed Wire. You Ooh. can't go wrong with Barbed Wire. Yeah. That, that may be the first time anybody's ever brought that one up. <laughs> yeah. uh, favorite? But, uh, any, any movie with uh, Tommy Morrison uh, gets my thumbs up. Right. Moving along. Favorite cyberpunk fictional character? Strange Days, too. Man, that was an all star cast. <laughs> uh, favorite cyberpunk fictional character? I mean, it's silly to say Rogue, but I've always been partial to Rogue. One, the relationship and story arc that she has over decades with Johnny in, in a multitude of, of ways is amazing. Uh, but then, as a character herself, I, I've always liked how carefully um artel sorian has used like that kind of shadowy legend yeah right because she's the one legendary constant at least for me throughout the entire kind of like story arc i mean maybe you could make an argument for machiko from the corporate say, say, side but rogue kind of represents the quintessential i mean rogue gets gets 
pretty fleshed out. Uh, and she has one hell of a character arc. Right, and it's and it's the kind of character arc that goes decades, right? We see it a person go from young to old, from, you know, uncertain to certain, and, and deal with... Solo to fixer. Yeah, troubles and tribulations all along the way. How do you not follow them? All right, next question. Favorite cyberpunk uh, novel? I will not be able to pick one by name. I haven't... Okay, no worries. I haven't, picked up a, I haven't had a... I think the last book I got to read cover to cover was last month I had a... Last month I had a trip and I got to read Blood of Elves cover to cover again because I, I wanted to prep for... do a little Witcher prep. Nice. But... Uh, I haven't gotten to read a cyberpunk novel in forever. Oh, you know what? My wife was writing one during Nana Remo, so I'm going to count that one. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, Dix, Gibson, Stevenson, or Sterling? Gibson. Uh, favorite cyberpunk comic or graphic novel, if any? Spider Man 2099. That's a good one. Is Shadowrun cyberpunk? Genre? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. It depends. It's a valid so answer. More than, huh? That's a valid answer. That's a valid answer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a it's such a specific genre that it's it's sometimes it's hard to nail down. Like some people would argue that like I've I've heard a debate that Blade Runner is too far future to count as cyberpunk. But I'm like it's not that far. Well, I, I think I, I mean, think I, it counts as cyberpunk, but Blade Runner is the progenitor of cyberpunk. Without Blade Runner, like the visual for cyberpunk would not exist. I've also heard the argument that Blade Runner is is not cyberpunk enough because you, nobody has like you don't see cybernetics. There's no net running. Yeah, I'm all like, dude, you guys are smoking crack. Be that, it doesn't get any more cyberpunk than Blade Runner. Before I continue, like, I for me it falls firmly in. Yeah, of course, this is cyberpunk camp, but. I've heard the debate. I don't know why. Um, before we continue, I just want to address the gorilla in the room, which is uh, Mr. Uh, John uh, Kowaleski. Oh, John's with us. Yes. He's on mute night right now. Hello, John. How are you? Good. How you been? Good. Busy. <laughs> Mac is way smarter than all that, all this stuff than I am. So <laughs> well, answer. we're not going to bombard you with our little questionnaire. Um, just Although, because as you were going through it. <laughs> yeah. A recent one that I think is underrated is Hotel Artemis. Yeah. I love that movie so very much. Oh, yeah. That was, um, that I, one I fell on by accident. I was just like, this is really good. That, I uh, fell on by accident too, yeah. I mean, it's not her best performance, but it is absolutely my favorite film with Jodie Foster in it. Yeah, it's it, it, it was fun. I don't know, Science of the Lamb was good with her. But... Uh, the the latest ep uh, the latest season of True Detective, I think that's probably her finest performance. Yeah, that that was that was a little weird that show for me actually. It was but, uh, it was well, really weird. But... I was trying to figure out. Are there ghosts? What's coming off the ice? The whole, just trying to get my head wrapped around it. But by the time it was all done, I was like, okay, I get it now, but it's still weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very weird. It, it, they leaned a little bit further into the supernatural aspect than any of the previous seasons. They've all kind of had it, but... The very uh, first True Detective that came out, I really enjoyed. And then it's yeah. kind of hit or miss for me since that first season like, of True Detective doesn't want to make you break out your Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. I don't know what will. Very true, especially with Carcosa. Um, <laughs> so, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, I know you guys have, uh, are uh, quite uh, busy of late. I know you're sucking my wallet dry. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, we want to thank uh, Monster Fright Club for joining us. Um, so you guys, you've created the Cyberpunk Red Combat Zone game. Um, you're doing Witcher Minis. Tentacle Town is a, another game by you guys. Uh, Borderlands, Mr. Torx Arena of Badassery, which I love the freaking name. 
You also produce uh, <laughs> game mats and uh, scenery uh, for your tabletop games. Um, just to give you our audience an understanding of who you guys are and what you guys provide to us. Well, I, I think the you probably want to go before that to know who we really are and then see where Monster Fight Club came from and then what we're doing now. Right. So that's uh, so, Gale Force uh, yeah. 9. Because you guys, have, you guys have come a long way. Well, well um, you, you know Gale Force 9? Yep. Yeah, I mean, when you guys started out, it seemed like you were doing like some like miniatures on more of the cheesecake side, which was a pretty niche market at the time. Well, I mean, uh, Gale Force 9, the board game company. Oh, yeah. That was mine. I founded it. Oh, I did not I did not realize that. <laughs> I ran it for 20 years. So that's that's so if you go and look at like Star Trek Ascendancy and yeah. um, Firefly the game, Spark yeah. a game of blood and treachery, um, Star Trek is uh, Star Trek Ascendancy. Um, all of those are ours. So those are all games that, you know, me with um, Aaron Dill and uh, Sean Swigert and the rest, rest of our guys. Yeah, we started that back in uh, 1998 and then um, ran that for 20 years. And then um, a few years back, we sold to Battlefront. And then coming up on the um, my 20-year anniversary, I thought I was going to uh, step back and take it easy and retire a little bit and uh <laughs> so i decided to uh to go off and do something else and uh the joke was is that they were like oh what are you going to do when you leave i said i don't know i'm gonna start a fight club it was, never <laughs> meant to be a company. It was always just a joke um back in the gale force nine days in the early days we used to mess around we had a bunch of young guys that worked for us so we would uh Anytime we saw a mud puddle, that was an opportunity for Fight Club. So we'd run over and splash each other, and we'd call it Fight Club. <laughs> and then, um, you know, fast forward, you know, a million years later, um, I decided to leave. And when I told the guys we were leaving, um, the team was like, well, if you're going, you know, we're going to go too. I'm like, what are you going to do? And they're like, I don't know. Maybe we'll start something new. I'm like, okay, what do you guys want to do? Crickets. <laughs> I'm like, all right, let me see what we can come up with. And uh, no better time to start a company than right before COVID, right? <laughs> right exactly. Right. I mean, I, I had no idea, and that is one hell of a pedigree. I love the Firefly game. So, yeah, so, I, yeah, I cannot of, believe I didn't realize that, that was you. Yeah, a lot of people yeah, don't know that Yeah, we, you know, we're not new to this. We're just a new name. We've been doing this a very, very, very long time. Um, too long, actually. And then um, when, right after I left, and I, I don't even remember which show I was at, maybe I was a Gamma or something like that, and I was walking around, and um, I saw I saw Mike Pondsmith, and, um, and they were talking about when Red was going to come out, the RPG. And I walked over, I introduced myself. I, I'd known him a little while, and um, we started talking it up and I jokingly said Mike you gotta let me do your figures I'm like well, we'll see what you got so I showed him a couple of things and um, you know, <clears throat> at the time he didn't realize that you know we did we did all the um, the D&D &D collectible figures yep um, the, the premium edition stuff um, and um, Charles Charles Woods who's um, guy he's been sculpting with me for at least 15 years um, he, he used to work for EA for a while. Um, James Cameron's Digital Domain. The guy is incredibly talented. And um, I actually found him on, I think, ArtStation or something. And uh, I saw I saw some work he did, and I reached out to him. I said, hey, you want to sculpt some figures for us? And uh, it was interesting. Back then when we started doing it, um, neither one of us really understood plastic. He understood sculpting for video games. Mm -hmm. but sculpting for miniature was very, very different. And that was also back, this was back before any of the cheap 3D printers or any of that sort of stuff. So there was, you know, that was back when guys were, you know, the old workshop guys doing putty and all that kind of stuff. And um, this is right when digital was starting to happen. So uh, Charles and I messed around with some things and um, I bought a very, very, very expensive printer. 
just to see what it could do and it, it did help on the business a little bit and then i remember when um the form labs kickstarter came out um the very first time and i was like wow you know here's a hundred thousand dollar printer that you can get for you know three or four grand yep and that changed everything because i got that resin printer started messing with it and um i used to mess around with the um the fdm printers a little bit and i just could never make them they would work out of the box for like the first day and then they'd get out of tune and they would never print mm. it again yeah they're a challenge up on all that for a very long time but i got very good at resin and then we got very good at casting resin and then we got very good at at you know figuring out how to get freelancers to to do sculpting for us and one of the things we found out about sculpting is you know there's there's so many sculptors out there that are talented and can do cool stuff but sculptors that understand how to sculpt for miniature is really really hard it's getting better now but um it used it used to be people didn't understand what stuff looked like because what looks good on the screen when it's blown up in your face yep doesn't really look that good on the tabletop there's a lot of exaggeration and things that need to happen to make a figure look really really good or to make it easier to paint or just to make it come out of the mold and that was um i give charles woods a lot of credit for that because the two of us um we learned together and we learned by stepping on every landmine out there and blowing it up and then we're like all right i think we kind of know what to do now and uh yeah uh, i just, mean i would yeah, definitely say you guys have figured out what to do because your miniatures are phenomenal and i i give a lot of that credit to charles but it's it's the concepts and stuff are, are usually a, a group a group effort but there's also just a lot of oh wouldn't this be cool yeah and then i'm the i'm the i'm the dumbass who says yeah let's do it you know <laughs> and, uh, let's not worry about the money we'll just make it make it cool and uh and it all kind of worked out. And then, when, you know, when you were talking about um, doing combat zone and whatnot, um, you know, we, we, start, we started doing the sculpting just for the RPG. And we were sculpting the yeah. stuff. Um, and, I remember when your miniatures, your Cyberpunk miniatures first came out. Like, I bought your first two seasons of those in the entirety back when I had uh, disposable income. Okay. And the Monster Fight Club, uh, the, the combat zone game, uh, was the very first thing I ever kickstarted. Oh wow! Okay, there was there was a lot of firsts on that, and the the thing about Kickstarter was, and even for us, that was all part. You know, that was the COVID thing with everything going out. Um, had that Kickstarter not been successful, we probably wouldn't have had any money left. Wow! Because that was right in the middle of everything else we were doing, and it was a a bit of a hell mary to see if we could do something else and i pitched the idea to mike because the the reaction system it's it was literally something i used to mess around with in my 20s and it was it was actually built around uh, plastic army men when it first came out just the concept of the colors and something easy that wasn't complicated but just open a lot and it's it's something that's always been floating in my head forever and never a good thing popped up and then we had all these wonderful miniatures sitting around and i felt like that you know most rpg guys don't collect a lot of miniatures they you know they get a couple for their main character or a couple of bad guys and they put them out there and that's what they have and i was always a huge fan of you know games workshop and the stuff they did back in the days and you know my ridiculous you know thirty thousand points of dark angels that i've played <laughs> forever and it was, you know, I'm, I'm way more of a mini guy, miniatures guy. So I really wanted some really good miniatures and I thought we were making some really great miniatures and then I wanted to do more with them. And that's kind of how Combat Zone came around. And um, Mike was kind enough to uh, let, us give us a go, let, let us give it a go. And um, so we kickstarted, that did well. Um, yeah, a thousand percent, out, right? Out. Oh my God, the, the, yeah, the stuff we went through for there. And then, um, then we finally got out in the world and then people started playing it. And 
the reviews are really, really good. Everybody seemed to really enjoy it. They, they, they kind of got the sense for, for what it is. And what I was trying to do when I first put this together is I wanted a storytelling miniatures game as opposed to using miniatures in an RPG. Yep. Because I was hmm. more a mini guy. So how, how can you tell stories with rules that are simple enough to do almost anything, but gives you a little bit of structure and able to do things with? And then, you know, we lock down with, you know, six different attributes. Most characters don't have any more than three. Um, weaker guys generally have two. The idea of just comparing you roll, I roll, you know, what do you roll based on a color? Um, the idea of um, green, yellow, red, you know, that's ingrained in you from kindergarten, you know, with stop signs and stop lights and all that kind of stuff. But the idea of, you know, my dice is bigger than your dice, therefore I should win. But one of the things that I think was important about this rule set when we put it together is if you really look at most games and you think about it over time, um, you 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 remember playing the game or you remember the story or things that happened, but especially in an RPG or if you're playing Magic or, or any game, you remember that time you either got screwed over really, really hard or you made some ridiculous save roll and that's that moment you remember. And what we were trying to accomplish in this was how do you create moments like that more often? And I think the big takeaway from the reaction system is, you know, you roll your dice, I roll my dice, we compare it, you know, tie goes to the defender. But I think the most important rule in that entire system is crits always win, fumbles always lose. Yep. So no matter how beat up you are, how bloody you are, guy outrolls you by 20 points. There's no way you can win and you roll a crit on a crappy D6. You win. Yep. And that lets you get out of a situation and comes up with some really cool storylines. We had a game that was being played about a month ago, and this is the one I remember all the time. Um, the mission was you had to kill the commander, and the, the assassin had to get off the table. That was one of the ones we were trying out. So I had a sniper up on a you know 10-story building up on the top, and I had these two guys coming up, the fire escape on the back coming up to the top of me. I take the shot at the end, I hit the guy, critical hit, kill them, take on the table. Now all I have to do is get off the table to win. So I'm out of I'm out of points, I got one thing left. Um, the guys come up over the top, open up a submachine gun, riddle me. I'm, I'm down hard. I go on the thing. My one final reaction I have. There's no way I can get anywhere, but the closest way to get off the table, which was only a foot away, but it was also two foot down, I just rolled my two inches off the top of the building. Fell to my death to the bottom, rolled my dice, failed, but I had a luck roll. So I used my <laughs> luck token, rolled it again, got a six. Nice. Nice. I survived the fall. Um, their next turn, they turn around and start running down the building to come and get me. I had one other character that was about 11 inches away. They used their action to run over. They used one to heal my guy up. They took a red back up to a green. Um, next turn, he comes around, doesn't have line of sight. Back to my character. I spend my green, nine inches to the edge of the board. Who's up? But that never happens. You know, having stuff like that happen, those are the things that you remember forever. Yeah. And um, Yeah, those epic, epic moments. Yeah. So we, so we're trying to make a game that creates as many epic moments as possible, but also lets you do a drive-by if you want to do it, or lets you, you know, be a cyber psycho and run around. And then the genre itself is just so much fun, um, and you just get excited about it and you want to play it. Yeah. So, so I know with uh, Mac, um, he mentioned that he used to play Cyberpunk 2020 as well as some Red. Uh, were you ever involved with uh, Cyberpunk 2020 back in the day? Boy, was he. <laughs> you got to do that uh, that live play with uh, uh, Paul oh, Smith yeah. and Lillard. And... Yeah, that's true. Monster Team. Oh, with Matt Team Monster. Lillard and... Right, oh, John? you yeah, talked about Mac. 
Uh, you jumped. Both of you? To be honest. <laughs> um, well, well, Mac, you, you talk about you can talk about your 2020 stuff. I mean, you know, I was I, I graduated from I graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy back in 2001, and um, most military guys I knew back then. If they were doing any sort of playing RPGs, most of them were playing in Cyberpunk. That was the game that, like, my army buddies were playing and everything else. So that was always something that was very cool in my head. Um, you know, I remember playing D&D as a kid when I went through, but the, the whole Cyberpunk thing resonated with me more than D&D did. I still like D&D and I enjoy it. Um, yeah. I didn't have the people around to play D&D with me when I was a kid. I loved the source books and building castles and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I didn't really get to play until I was at school. And those guys were playing cyberpunk, so that's kind of got me in. It was it was always just very surreal that, you know, going to school to be a merchant marine captain. And, you know, 30 years later, you know, you're talking to your idols and you're helping to create more things in the world and you get to it's it's very cool nice yeah it, it is yeah um the that's that's been the magic of this show for us is uh we've gotten to talk to so many so many people that we literally idolized uh for the last you know 30 years or so um and we're uh, we're slowly moving through and, and getting to talk to all these people, and each and every one of them, each person we've talked to so far, uh, we've come away from the end of the show just being all like, you know, that's totally somebody I would have hung out with in high school or whatever. Yep. And, and what's really funny is, you know, the, the the cool guys today, a lot of those weren't the cool guys back then. No. no. <laughs> And you know, I, I remember even in even even at the academy when we would mess around and you know and play stuff. You know, I was I was the quote captain of this of the scuba team, and that was because it gave me a place that we could lock a door and play. Hmm. You know, it, it wasn't cool back then to do this sort of stuff, and the guys who did it, you kind of found each other accidentally. Yep, and then you realize, oh, this is awesome. And the next thing you know, you're you're stealthing around and doing all this. And then the thing that really cracks me up is fast forward, you know, 15, 20 years later, and people who I never thought were gamers are absolutely gamers. And they've been doing it forever, and everybody's just been quiet. Nobody's been talking about it. And I love the fact that everybody's just out there now doing what they want to do. And Yeah, I mean... Yeah. It's it's reached the point where we've got like high status celebrity, like actors who are coming out and admitting that they're they've been gaming for decades. Yep. Like you would have never heard that in the nineties, never. Well, I remember on one of the forums back in mid two thousands, um, in which Altar Sorian mentioned how they. Uh, had to like overnight a uh, version of Night City Sourcebook to Robin Williams. Um, yeah, because he was, he was running. <laughs> I was going to mention when I was when I was uh, younger, Robin Williams uh, came into a game store in our local. I wasn't there, but it came into the game store in our local uh, uh, community, and it was. I, we must have talked about that for nine months. <laughs> I bet. Um, I mean. I, like I said, A-list at Vin Diesel is huge into gaming. Uh, Henry Cavill. Like, these guys who are just the giant action stars of, of the current generation, and they're just openly admitting to being giant nerds. Henry, Henry's a really cool dude. When you watch his interviews and stuff, he's on there. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the next thing you know, the two dudes are talking about Necrods, and all the girls are like, here we go. <laughs> You know, it was like, all right, cool. <clears throat> so uh, let's get back to uh, what Monster Fight Club has to offer. It seems like you guys have like tons of stuff coming out of late. Um, so I just want to like get through uh, some of the stuff that that has recently come out because I know, like I said, it's it's hurting my wallet <laughs> with. Uh, the, I can't uh, even afford any of it anymore. So. Yeah. So um, I, just, I just look at it and drool. 
So the Cyberpunk Edgerunner edition, um, how'd that come yeah. about? And did you guys coordinate or collaborate with uh, CDPR and Trigger at all? Uh, yeah, so so the way that all that all panned out is, you know, you we're all doing our Cyberpunk Red stuff, and it's very cool. And then trying to think where it was going on then um mike was mike was talking about um them working on the edge runners expansion for for red for the rpg and then you know i was like oh well, we get to do we get to do uh ours too right and hmm. nobody, and nobody really said no it was more of a <laughs> preemptive we get to do it right and then um and then because because it you know it was based on someone else's IP. Then that's when CDPR got involved. And the cool bit there was um, Mike made the introductions for us. So we got to, oh, yeah. so, so they made the introductions. We showed them what we could do with really cool miniatures and whatnot. Um, we explained how, you know, what we wanted to do was do red, but do it for edge runners. And one of the, the big reasons I wanted to do it was the, the rule set, in my opinion, is is so unique and so good and so accessible by a lot of people that I thought that this would be a really great way to get the fandom of edge runners to start playing the game mm -hmm. to reverse bring them back to red and right. expand the rest of the universe. And that's what it seems to be doing right now, which is which is very cool. And then what was really great about that too is when, um, when we were talking to CDPR and um, talking with those guys, um, they're 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 super great to work with. Just as far as you know, you tell me what what you want to do, and they they say yay or nay, or they give you their feedback. One of the things we did is um, when we were laying out the the new game area and the buildings and the look and everything we're doing um they came back and said well you know if you're doing this stuff then you probably want to be in this zone and here's a whole bunch of art assets from that area oh, and, nice. um, and we were like all right that's super cool and then and then we're like well then we had a lot of back and forth where i think i was getting confused and next thing i know they're like no we mean this oh. and they practically did the layout of the board and the buildings for us Oh, wow. And we're like, wow, <laughs> that's awesome. I'm like, can we just use all that? You know, like, yeah, well, you know, fine tune it a little bit, but yeah. And that's what we did. That's and so, cool. you know, we, we changed locations, got all that stuff in there. And then the, um, the other thing that happened for edge runners, which I'm actually excited about, and I wasn't sure how the public was going to react to it, um, was the introduction of standees to it the the higher end acrylic standees um we made we sculpted all the models and it was always going to be about the models and the miniatures and putting the stuff out there but you know miniatures are expensive tooling is expensive making the stuff's expensive and you know the game that we wanted to put out was expensive by the time you got everything that you wanted to do into it yeah and when we sat back and started looking at it one of the things we did was um we mocked up some we mocked up some standees, but the thing that we're doing different from the standees that other people have done is all of our standees are actually our miniatures. So the way yeah. we do a lot of our artwork is, you know, we do the concept art and whatnot, and then we go and sculpt the miniatures. And then we take the miniatures and use those almost not as tracing paper, but it's as the reference that the artists use to paint it up and make it look good for the cards and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and we went and digitally painted a bunch of the, the miniatures in order to, you know, for renders and whatnot they were doing, and they looked really, really good. And then we realized that you can shoot a digital camera from one side and then put one on the other side at the same time. So you can get the exact same pose on the front and the back. Take that and put it on a two-dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. And because we had all the equipment in-house, we went ahead and did those, and they looked really good. And so we took them to Adepticon, and what was fun there was um, in the display cabinet behind, we used half of the standees and then half were real painted models. And a lot of people had to do a double take when they first looked because they are the same models. And just like a, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say they're, they're beautiful, and 
they're a much more cost effective way of like army building uh having gonks and having npc or uh civilians and all that um and then you you get your actual miniatures for your main dudes yep and the thing that i was excited about was one of the one of the scary things for a lot of people in miniature games is simply building the miniatures so people could get a box of miniatures and it never looks as good as what they see in the store a lot of if especially if you've never painted before and it's a real challenge just to get into it and they don't get to play the game right away because they spend the first month of their life trying to figure out how to put these models together and make them sort of look good yeah and being able to just pop the standees out put them on the table and actually be playing the game right away is exciting and then if you get really into it it's real easy to add on and learn the hobby side of it later um i think a lot of people out there will look at how beautifully painted these models and stuff are and unless you're really into the painting hobby you know it, it's hard yeah um, especially I, I, some people can yeah, get frustrated I, I with paint, it i paint and i'm you know i'm tabletop ready at best for my skill of painting um i was much better when i was younger but i don't have the time anymore so you know to have painted models for me you know i go out and get people to paint them for me just because yeah. i don't have the i don't have the you know when i was young i had more more time than money and now it's kind of flipped around. I have no time anymore because of the, just the endless list of things that, that we have to do. One of the, everybody thinks that when you're running a, a game company, oh my God, it's playing games and stuff all the time. 90% of what you do sucks. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, well I tell you what, uh, <laughs> speaking of painting, you guys, one of my favorite products you guys have and one of the most innovative is you guys sell the individual miniatures with a painting kit and a how-to like that's brilliant so um, I, I have to give credit for that one to vallejo so vallejo has been making sets like that for a while for for different games and different people that were out there and they reached out to us when cyberpunk was coming out and they said you know hey you know we'd love to make some paint sets for you we'll you know we'll get we'll get angel who's a phenomenal painter to uh paint them up and teach people how to paint and what i love about it especially the videos and stuff that come with it too um he, he takes it nice and slow from the beginning so for someone that hasn't done a lot of it before it's it's a great way to get into it and get started yeah i, yeah. I mean it, it comes with the paints that are necessary uh, each little kit, and I mean, they're significantly different from each other, in in terms of you know the style and all that. It's in it's color, one of the cool ideas I've seen. If you look at it, there's not a, I don't there may be one repeat color or something, or maybe two, but they did a really good job. And I, I said, you know, if somebody buys all four, I don't want them to get all the same color palette for each thing. They're like, no, 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 no we'll break it up and do all of this. And um, yeah, that. That did, a, that did a really good job meeting people. And then the other thing that I love, is especially if um, I'm going to do a plug for our Discord right now, um, <laughs> just because if you go into the painting section in the Discord, oh, my God, there's such talented people out there. There is. They put me, they put me to shame yeah. on a regular basis. And you look at this stuff, and, you know, a lot of the only thing guys who paint seem to really want to do, you know, they – they, they do it for the love of the hobby. They don't do it for money. They do it. They just want people to look at them and say, hey, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I try to do that. And you know what? I look at some of the people who painted for the first time and you look at their stuff and I wouldn't give it a nine out of 10, but you know what? I still have the first freaking, um, oh, what the hell did I paint? The old freaking one of the goblins i think from from my original D, &D set one of the old uh ralph partha models and Ooh. oh my god it's so bad yeah i still have a few <laughs> of those lying <laughs> around after shiny green you know it was probably four green or something like that and you painted it all up and i was so proud of it when the thing came out and um i still have that figure today just because it's 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 very cool to look back at where you were to see yeah. it, you know, 
a piece of your personal history. Like, this is where I was. This is where I am now. Yep. And I think it's a, a yep. tribute to your company that, you know, Vallejo reached out to you. Um, because I, I've seen a lot of their other kits that they usually do um, when it comes to the, 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 the their paint sets that they do. Um, those model, models are often, or the miniatures are often, like, pretty top-notch quality. So I think that shows that they respect, you know, what you guys are putting out as well. I, I think so a little bit. I think I think they were excited about, you know, the, the idea of cyberpunk to begin with, um, you know, with the whole, all the cyberpunk hype that was out there. And, you know, you know, when 2077 came out, and all of the all of the grumblings and stuff, I enjoyed every single bit of it, even the bugs. Yeah, you know the the idea of just I mean God, the first time I saw a trauma team roll out, you're like, oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all those things in your head that you actually get to see in reality. It's yeah. just the ultimate sandbox and stuff. It's it's like even now, um, when we're you know. I just sit home at night sometimes and I, you know, and I, I jump on the bike and I freaking keep looping night city. <laughs> yeah. Just, just it's, wander around. Cause it's, it's only taken 30 years, but now you can just wander around night city in a full three, the environment. And it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. So I, I haven't been able to get my bike faster than 155 miles an hour, <laughs> even downhill. I can't figure that out. Might need a mod. Mm. Um, so going back to the edge runners, um, did you guys add new rules to the combat zone or is it still just straight, uh, combat zone, uh, react system? Go ahead, Matt. Take this one. Um, so there's new rules in that we added in a new, uh, campaign system. It's designed for a, to be a campaign for two right out of the box. Um, so we do have a new campaign system in there, but it is the same rule set. It is intended and designed to be fully compatible with uh the the cyberpunk uh red combat zone game that exists now okay. i i even took the new care i took main and david and his crew and tanaka uh into account when doing my metagame math when i'm looking at kind of the uh the ter high-end tournament metagame like i didn't i i'm very much brewing them into our game as a whole okay so now, are they going to be integrated with you guys' uh, tournament system? Or are they going to be Absolutely. like an exception? Yeah, they, oh, okay. they are tournament legal. Paint, paint Rebecca and the gang up. Uh, Tanaka's, I think, really going to affect our metagame in some healthy ways because he makes uh, gonk-focused Arasaka really viable. And I like the idea of uh, Arasaka having two options, one being, hey, here's just overwhelming manpower of, of you know, every every idiot we've got working for us or you know here's our elite crew that i actually briefed for this mission you know i like those two different play styles and and i i really think it's going to start affecting our metagame in some, some really healthy and, and i've i've got to give mac a lot of credit um you know mac i don't know if you i came on a little bit late but if you went into any of the stuff you worked on before um mac's got quite a pedigree as well um our whole team does and so having Mac, you know, take the reins on the rule set here and really run with it, it is it is definitely a better game because he is looking after it than it was, you know, when I first laid out the original rules. Yeah, it's before the also added John good enough to the team. <laughs> Goody, another great designer. Yeah, before before we started the show, Mac was uh, telling us a little bit about his background and yes. <laughs> It is his, his nickname is the second edition guy. Uh, the <laughs> games you, that want to be you know, successful bring him in I, for the second edition. First edition, but I'll take what I can get, right? It, yeah. It's 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 a, it's a skill set. I mean, it's it's hard to to come on and stay true to the original idea, but still add your own creativity to it and expand on it and keep the original flavor of the whole thing. And I think he's doing a good job with that easier when you've got an engine that really makes it like anything you can imagine it's very easy to write the rule for it so you don't have to get really into the weeds on how the mechanics work you can just 
kind of outline it with the dice and let them decide the the results and it just it kind of auto balances itself because of the reaction system itself right like oh you just did a wound to me great let me take an action and because there's such an interplay there's immediate self-balancing so we get to be a little wilder with our rules because when one player gets an advantage it very quickly kind of writes itself to a a tighter game as john said earlier you, you've always got a shot <laughs> I, I tell you what um my favorite thing about the combat zone rules and this is from purely a personal selfish uh point of view is the limiter mm. uh, i i love that system and it, it it takes me right back to the late 80s when my brother and i were creating rules for our gi joe figures to fight each other and we used a uh I had used colored marker to color in uh, with various colors, the same as it works on the limiter almost, uh, a piece of uh, Taylor's tape. Yeah. And that would, you know, stretch out for uh, movement and weapon range and stuff like that. And seeing someone else to do something kind of similar to that just really hit me right in the heart. Uh, I, I, I absolutely love that system. I would... I would very much like to see that uh, expanded to other things. I really um, like how that limiter bends because it is a great visual to bend the limiter, not oh, just around beautiful. the corner, but also like to jump over something. You can just be like, yeah, all right, boom. I'm going to make that roll and just jump over a, a container, or, you know, something like that because the you can just visually represent it. So, so let me tell you where where for me all this came from and why it was so special for me my entire life. Um, my dad was a, was a diehard Marine, ended up going to the Secret Service, um, worked for um, Nixon wow. and Ford and Carter during those time things, um, and then later um, ended up uh, going to U.S. Customs. He was, he was, a, very, um, he was a very stern guy. Um, we never really played, you know, he was a gamer. He, I remember on the bookshelf, the the old Avalon Hill, like squad leader games, yeah. you know, the old chick games were up there, but that was, that was for adults. Kids never got to do that. You know, that's <laughs> real tech. that was the, the big guys games. And that was something we always did. So my dad and I never really got a chance to play games together. And one day I was probably 10 or 11. I was homesick and my dad was working shift work so he happened to be home during the daytime and you could tell I was I was bored and there was nothing to go on and what I did have was this giant ridiculous collection of plastic army men um, of every you know I had the grays and the blues and the greens and everything else and we spent a half a day setting up four or five hundred army men in the living room Ooh. all over the place and got the armies done. And I was like, I'm gonna move my guys. And my dad's like, you can't just move your guys. You can only move a certain distance. And he's like, he's like, the guys on foot can only go this far. And he grabs a piece of string. And he's like, they can go this far. And he goes, you know, the tanks can go farther and the jeeps can go farther, so they can go this far. And then for shooting, <laughs> we had, the guys were allowed to shoot rubber bands off their fingers. The <laughs> um, grenades were a rolled up sock that we would throw, and an airstrike was the pillow from the couch that you would uh, oh, nice. cramp the room. And if anybody was standing, anybody I knocked over was out. And so, so we spent most of the day doing that. And then we kept doing it, and then he kept shooting me. And I'm like, he's like, okay, I shoot you with this. I'm like, where are you shooting me from? He's like, you got to find the figure. And I, I'm look, I can't find this thing anywhere. And he had he had one of the little snipers like laying in the flower pot. And he would get over close to it, and he kept picking me off one by one as it was going through with this thing. And, you know, that is the the quintessential memory of my father that I remember. But the That's idea beautiful. of having string with distance representing things and to keep it simple, that, that kind of what started it off for toy soldiers for me. Why aren't we making that game? That sounds <laughs> awesome. 
that's another Kickstarter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with the Cyberpunk uh, Edge Runner, so I, one thing I did notice in one of the main characters was uh, Faraday. Are you guys looking to, you know, um, add in more factions and other uh, sculpts of some of the characters that were in Cyberpunk Edge Runners, or is it kind of like a, a one-off? Go ahead, Mac. To say Faraday is a tricky one since he's he's very much their fixer, and while we do have some fixer characters on the table, fixers are also a very much not hanging out in the combat zone kind of group of people. Um, you know, they they run the gambit, and Faraday always feels like a weird, you know, uh, bring into the combat zone. Uh, that's not to say we'll never do him, but he's not. He's the one kind of recognizable character that isn't currently in the game. So why don't you why don't you give him the uh, the the current thinking for the the fixer idea that we've been pitching around? One of the oh man, well one of the things we want to do is kind of loosen not loosen up, but play around with how how uh, campaign teams are put together. We want to create some real replayability uh, in your campaigns because. We've started to get players, they've, they've played through uh, the campaign two or three times, they're starting to see the patterns, they're getting really good at it, they're starting to finish their campaign in seven, eight games. I think the record is, is seven now. Uh, it, you know, it was 12 like three months ago. Some some of the campaigns have really like legitimately gone really quick because guys have gotten good at it and gotten some lucky, some lucky uh, objective cards. So we've been looking at ways to make the campaign uh, play more replayable. And for that, one of the next things we're looking at is fixer cards, which will uh, combine a couple of uh, factions for you, give you some other special rules, and kind of uh, mix up how you begin your campaign or build your, you know, maybe even your tournament uh, characters. So it's uh, it'll be uh, a lot of new combos hitting the table. So so think of the idea of you know you're allowed to build your you know right now. You're allowed to build your factions a very specific way. Certain mm -hmm. guys are allowed to do certain things. However, if you are hired to do something by a certain fixer, he might have core people that normally don't get to play with each other. They get added to your group because he's going to send them along with you. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that gives you the opportunity to do some stuff that normally you don't get to do. And we're having a lot of fun with with some of the mashups that you can do this way. And the current thinking is you might end up, maybe there's, you know, five or six different fixers out there. And part of, part of the whole thing going to a tournament is, oh, you bring the fixer you want to bring. Who is your fixer? And that's just as important as who your gang is and who you're playing with. And certain fixers might not get along. And so if you have, you know, this fixer and I have that fixer, it might completely change how things are happening because, you know, they don't care about money at this point. They just want to kill each other. Right. So you bring in a lot more of the, the tabletop RPG way uh, of doing things and bringing that into into combat zone. And, and, and why would you not try to incorporate some of that because of how cool the world is? You know, might, I mean, there's so much out there. And you, Agreed. I just wish we could work faster. <laughs> yeah, right. There's so much out there we want to do, and you can only go so fast. Well, my salary needs to make sure that you guys feed me slowly over time. <laughs> um, I can just stare at the windows and, and, and wish. Uh, looking at you guys' product line is like looking at the... It's like looking at the Sears catalog when we were kids, man. I Like, oh my God, this stuff is so cool. I'll never be able to afford it, but Jesus Christ... Is that is is that an amazing daydream? Man, that's a deep cut for me. I used to uh, love the uh, Christmas one because I I used the to dream that maybe I'd get a bow and arrow. Yeah, one of those archery sets so bad. Well, I was thinking of like Kenner with uh, all the Star Wars figures. The yeah. the GI Joe aircraft carrier. <laughs> well, well, that was that was the comparison with that container ship we just did. Yeah. It's, yeah. The funny thing about the container ship is right now um, in our building, we have a second floor that's half vacant, and uh, we have like 26 ships now oh, all geez. lined up in, in, <laughs> oh, in, in, in different levels of construction. As uh, 
as we're, we're, we're starting to assemble the stuff together. My, my problem with things is I tend, I build, I build stuff and it looks really, really good. And because I've got a bit of an engineer's mind, um, I'm like, I think I can put that together easier. The thing that, that I keep fighting with with this is the entire container ship, the entire assembly, there is no glue. Oh, oh wow! Nice. It is all joinery. <laughs> that size, that's that's really surprising. It is all joinery. It's all um, it's all slide this piece into that piece. Tolerances are are perfect. Um, and oh, man, it's like those old Rebel not, Snap on yeah, kits. Yeah, it, it's it's super cool. And then as soon as I get done with it, it's like okay, I've done that, and I need to I want to go on to the next thing. <laughs> and then um, so I've I've got an oil tanker version of that now where I added all the piping and stuff and then the pipes doing the pipes then made me want to build an oil rig. And then after <laughs> I got those done, I'm like, Oh, these pipes will look really cool coming out of the buildings. Well, was and that I'm the, like, you know what? I don't have a good set of duct work yet. The next thing I know, I ended up making my duct work Legos. Um, so stay tuned for uh, metropolis two in uh, November. <laughs> well, I figured but, the um, inspiration was from your uh, merchant Marine days. It, it, it was too. Well, actually, the, the, for the ship, I've always wanted to build a ship. And then the fact that, you know, the game I played with Mike and, and Lillard and those guys, you know, Mike sent us out to go after to go after the Amberlin, which was a AI-driven container ship. And that was... Mike is a huge... What a great uh, name. Mike loves ships. Yeah. Uh, living, living in Seattle, he's not too far away from, um, you know... The waterfront area and stuff so he sees you know puget sounds the ships coming in all the time we've had some wonderful conversations talking about well, ships and how didn't they work and... didn't mike be part of the merchant marines or am i mistaken on that i don't know it's i we never he never mentioned that to me but he has he has been on ships and stuff though because he has a really good working knowledge of how they work yeah because i know he had um his fan or his father was in the military um and he spent some time in Japan and in other places. I could have sworn he mentioned that he was part of like the Merchant Marines or, or some some other service that really uh, got him close to you know. You know the thing being on the on the sales about during that game when he was going through and the um, when Lucky was flying the AV four and we were approaching the ship. There was a there's a section there if you go back. There was something following the ship in the water. <laughs> and we flew over it. But then it disappeared under the waves. And it was mechanical. Well, if you, if you know the history of the world, right, is uh, during the Fourth Corporate War, a lot of the, the subs were auto, auto or run by AIs. So, and that's one of the reasons why Time of the Red was just got so screwed up especially when it came to like cargo um and transportation is because of those <clears throat> those AIs were unleashed against whoever was traveling the seas you know because of the iff yeah now there's a uh, bunch of sub submarines run by rabbits just just lurking under <laughs> the water like like sharks kind of sounds like today a little bit yeah a little, a little bit, bit. A little funny how uh what did mike say you know this is this is an, a, an aspiration this is a precautionary tale guys yeah this is a warning oh trust me um we know <laughs> just yeah it's not the just as an, just as an aside uh before we get into uh more questions about your your products how did it like Danger Gals came out, and the art is entirely made up of uh, the miniatures that you guys created. Oh, the Danger that Gals was, the yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really cool. Like, uh, yeah, that, did it? Did, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. That that. I'm not sure if that was if that was Jay or 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 whose idea that was to take them and flush them out, but. Um, but it was a great idea, and I just love how, you know, 
we, we created all this really, really cool stuff. And that was one of the easiest ways to do a wonderful tie in between both sides. You yeah. Did. Yeah. I mean, you had all the concept art sitting there just ready uh, to create the sculpts. And I mean, it worked out wonderfully. Um, and one of my favorite things you guys do is with some of your miniatures that you've created, you give shout outs back to the original 2020 line. Like, uh, for the Bozos and Maelstrom, you've got direct um, miniature representations of, like, Chris Hawkabout's original art for for the Maelstrom and the Bozos. Oh, well, well we have all the, you know, you have all the, the source material. So sometimes I, th I think you forget where the inspiration for certain things came from. You just know it's cool. And then you realize, yeah. oh, we got it from there as you're going through and so stuff looks great and then the other the other really neat thing about working with all of this is sometimes you just want to do this kind of archetype cool looking guy just for the sake that he's cool and you really aren't building around any particular one thing it's more of a feeling of you know this dude in this one show and this happened and that happened but when yeah. it's well when it's all done and laid out and you know you know, I'll send a text to Mike and I'll send him the picture. I said, Hey, what do you think of this figure? And I'm like, who is he? And then he dumps, you know, five minutes later, you get like three paragraphs of awesomeness. <laughs> and now that's who he is. Okay. I'm not even going to argue that point. It, that's him. Yeah. And it becomes canon <laughs> essentially. And it's, 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 it's a, it's a wonderful creative way to do things because you're not, Sometimes when you're doing stuff for licensed companies and doing things, it's they are very specific about what they want and they don't let you deviate too much. And one of the cool things about Cyberpunk that Mike told me was, you know, it's a it it's a time, it's a feeling, it's everything that's out there is cyberpunk. Yep. You can't do it wrong. If you yeah. can think of it it works. Just figure out how to plug the numbers with it and run with it. And that's what we've been doing. And it's, and it's been great. Yeah. So I'd like to say uh, congratulations. You've already achieved over 300% uh, uh, backing towards your uh, Vehicle Mayhem Kickstarter. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the, um, that means we get to make a really cool AV4. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things for there, um, a lot of people have been looking at and they're like, um, okay, so what factions for this for and whatnot? You know, it, as it was described to me, you know, it's it's kind of like the Econo van, you know, of the flyers that's out there. You can you can buy a, an airframe and then kind of do whatever you want to do with it. Yep. So while we while we've been showing, you know, Max Stack, our imagination of what Max Stack's version might look like when you're going through it. But there's not there's nothing to say that it can't be anybody's. Was it stolen? Was it taken? Was it bought? Was it modified? And one of the things that we are going to be doing with this kit when it's finished is, uh, while there is a correct way to put it together, in that you know, you know, the the stern attached to the frame, you know, the air soles are up to the side, you know, but there are mounting points. There are different different cabins that you can actually plug into the cavity that's up oh in that the sounds freaking cool the the inside um the the back end of it um in in the in the little fun video that we put together for it that was in the front um you know it kind of shows the door sliding to one side and the guys you know coming out with their machine guns and opening up on everybody else but there's also a door that folds down it's more like more like a regular aircraft where you kind of you know roll it out of a you know, a, a G6 or something that lays down. Also on the inside, it's completely detailed on the entire inside of it. And on the back end, there's actually a ramp that drops down like in an H46 helicopter. There's enough room inside there to put a bike that can come rolling out the, rolling out of the back. Um, <laughs> the seats that are in there don't have to be put in the back because it's modular. So if you want to leave room for, you know, trauma team gear, do that. If you want to make it cargo, do that. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done with the with the with the set um this particular one when we're going through um 
we did we did water transfers for the first time with um, the container ship Kickstarter. But mm-hmm. we got the samples of all this graffiti and stuff that we did to slap over our existing containers. And they came out really, really good. Oh. So we're like, okay, this is neat. So let's let's go ahead and do the logos and, and do stuff that can be slapped on the outside of this to change it up. The um, on on the um, the nose of, of the A V on the front, um, it's it's actually got a place where there's a front gun that can be clipped in there, but I think there's two guns and there's there's a, um, I think there's a camera. I think there's um, an electronics array, and all of these are gear cards. So you swap it out with something else, and Mac has written up the rules for these. So every single bit of this modifies something else when the thing gets put together. So um, you got your base points for it, but you can also add gear, and you can add kit, and you can add people. That's, that's so ridiculously exciting. So it's it is it is not just a it is not just something cool that looks on the table that you're not going to do something with. Um, there there's a lot going on with that, and you know, one of the things that you know, every now and then I feel like I come up with one cool little idea. But you know, when you're when you were playing 2077, and you know you and Jackie are driving her out, and he goes, "Hey, check this out," you know, and the AV flies over, and Max Tack drives down. They light the guys up on the side while you're watching all of that. Yeah. But, but the projection that goes on the bottom, um, you know, the caution stay stay away that gets projected on the ground to make people get out of the way. Or when Trauma Team came in, so we built that as a deployment template. Yeah, I saw so, that. So so even even if you don't have an AV. You could still play as if you did simply with a template. So we're trying to make it accessible that, you know, it doesn't have to be there to be represented on the table. Nice. So no matter what your budget, you can still play with it. So I think that's pretty cool. I, I did that's very I, cool. When I was testing that, as I had multiple tables playing, and the AD4 could only be in the Heracles can only be in one place. And so the template would get dropped on other tables to show where it was going. And it was leapfrogging from table to table. I love people. that idea in a tournament. We kind of you know, going to attack the table back. next to you. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were having a good time with it. We were moving models from one table to the other. Uh, at one point, uh, uh, a bozo uh, hung on to the bottom as it went from one table to the other just to do it. <laughs> So one one question that we've had a couple of people asking, and we haven't really gone into it that much yet, but um, Mac, why don't you talk about quickly about the the idea of you know the the general table you know is twenty two by thirty, it's not that big, um, and the AV itself you know it's it's ten ten and a half inches long, it's big when this thing's flying around, and it's 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 kind of like um, you know, flyers and workshop. It's like, what do you do with this thing when it seems so overpowered and bringing things in and bringing things out? But I, I thought Matt came up with some really cool ways of of movement and cracking movement and how does it move around on the table and how do you represent where it is and not having it being such the dominating thing that if you don't have one, you automatically lose because it's not about that. It's more about deployment and getting from one place to another fairly quickly. And, you know, if you have a flyer flying across a 30 inch area, it's instantaneous. Yeah. So you're really more talking about where do you come in from? What do you do when you're there? And then you leave and you can fly away really, really fast. But now you're just popping up on another side because you're essentially flying a big loop and coming back and doing things. And John mentioned earlier was how we look to make these moments with the rules, right? We want the we want that what's called a Ludo narrative, those kind of cool, memorable moments. And one of the things about the entire game engine is that it puts us into the end game of a scenario. In a lot of miniatures games, there's you know, there's the, the two or three turns of getting into position and figuring things out and exchanging a little fire, but then like the game near the end kind of really heats up. Well, our game jumps right into that phase. And because of that, there isn't a lot of time for repositioning. So 
that Heracles needs to come in and achieve a goal when it's sweeping in, or the goal needs to be to come in and get people out. So integrating it into the game was a really fun kind of, kind of how do we make that in-game moment with this thing awesome? Uh, how do you give it that kind of Schwarzenegger high octane style over substance feel? It's yeah. funny you said Schwarzenegger. It's like I think one of the one of the things that we kept we keep doing is you know I think we're trying to create every cool '80s moment that exists in a movie at some point and put it in the right genre. It's like you know I'm I'm in, I was I told Mike I wanted to build a Max Tack prison. And, put both together. and then and then he looked at me and he goes max stack doesn't take prisoners <laughs> and i'm like i guess we're doing a, a night city prison then he goes now that would be something different and then we started talking about what that might look like and figuring that all out which is which is which is fun so. oh lord yeah and and the thing i can see with um this kickstarter especially with the bikes and i don't think it's not gaslands i'm trying to think of of what what game it is but basically kind of like a, a rolling fight no well kind of like car wars yeah um there's well, another know. game system that's out there in which you have a rolling uh road in which you know you're battling uh each other as you're going down the road car wars i think was the first game to do yeah. it with the uh kind of leapfrogging road sections yep yeah, yeah uh car wars does it gaslands i believe uh has a way to do that so you can do full freeway fights and that's definitely what he's did it it's it's funny because that's kind of one of the things i was writing right now was rules for how to that's what i've been doing all day is writing up those scenarios for <laughs> to show john on friday <laughs> nice also there was one thing that you mentioned earlier um about water decals uh for yeah. the uh graffiti are those going to be available at your shop Oh yeah, all that stuff is. So the the we did it as just kind of a stretch goal for fun. Yeah. But then after we got the samples in, we're like, how come nobody does these anymore? They're so good. <laughs> and they, they weren't they weren't as hard to use as I seem to remember they were when I was twelve. And um, yeah, and now you're you're sitting there messing around, but um, we have um, we have Mason who who's um, he also with the 3D printers and, and on the production side of things here. And he is a huge Gungum guy. Right. So, you know, I gave him, you know, I tried to do one and it looked okay. And then I said, hey, I know you work on this stuff more. Take, so he takes this thing home over the weekend. The entire sheet got dumped all over one of the red containers. And I'm just like, God, this looks <laughs> so good. <laughs> you know? nice. And then we're like, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. So, you know, oh, part of the thing. Got too, your. You got your chocolate in my peanut butter. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was fun. And and the other the other side of this is that there is just so much cool art in it between the the original source books and the new source books and the video game and everything else that's out there. It's it it's silly not to take use of it. Um, I yeah. know when when we did the Metropolis Kickstarter, the first one we did with the. Um, the HDF buildings with the clips and stuff when you built the thing together. My only problem, it wasn't a problem, and I, I still like how all that looks, and the new one that I'm doing is reverse compatible, so everything you could have had before works with all the new stuff, but the new stuff even makes it better. Um, but I felt it was too clean, mm -hmm. and it wasn't dark enough. And then we started playing around that with that a little bit and kind of started blowing some buildings up. And then we started um, the last, uh, the second printing of Combat Zone. We went and did some graffiti and stuff placed on some things. And we've done a couple of buildings where we've done some other artwork and stuff on the outside. And what's been fun with this now is um, once we started messing around with edge runners, it was literally, no, no, any, anything that's out there had that so suddenly we get to do you know the real water signs and we get to start you know doing um doing um uh, ac acrylic banners and um start um, one of the ones i like right now oh the thing we haven't showed it off problem is is we have a lot of stretch goals that haven't opened yet because of where things are and hopefully they open but anything that does it opened will become something later 
right. because the ideas are too cool not to. But the um, so you look at how tokens are made, right? Yeah. The standees and all that stuff. Now imagine that's the shape of a TV or monitor, and now put the cool graphics on the back side of that, and now snap that into a really cool piece of plastic that sells it. Yeah. Yeah. So then, then you take the idea of that and you said, okay, so if you if you go into 2077 and you see how when you're driving around and you look at the buildings that are on the outskirts, um, all the wires and stuff seem to be hanging on the outside and they've got, you know, you know, they've got, um, what am I thinking of, solar panels and all kinds of just electronics going all, you know, conduits and yeah. in this and all of that when it goes all the way through. All that greebling absolutely adds to everything that's out there. And I've worked that out. So oh, nice. we've got we've got all this greebling stuff that looks cool. The buildings are now, while they still have the corner pieces, they have these um, basically tops and bottoms now that allows things to actually connect together in an asymmetrical way. And what I mean by that is imagine a building that doesn't have to be stacked directly on top of itself. It can now be shifted off to the side. So now you nice. get cool overhanging things. And then think about like Ready Player One or something like that, where the containers are sticking out of the sides of the buildings. That now happens. Or you're taking a series of them, snicking them together, and now you've created a walkway that's five containers long, or you're building a fortification out in the middle of the desert someplace. And Militech, you know, it's like a, it's like a fob that's being dropped in the middle of the desert because, you know, the nomads are getting out of hand. <laughs> Right. All of those things are being addressed right now. Cool. I mean, my dream, my dream product for for a miniatures line for Cyberpunk would be a stackable skyscraper that you could run through, uh, like a like a tabletop version of Raid the Redemption or Dread, where you're just going floor by floor by floor. Metropolis, uh, John put together this amazing metropolis set That's... it has full floors and stairs and yeah. everything now you... as cool as that one was the modularity and the accessibility of the different levels now has been amped up exponentially every single level think... now is playable yeah i think your dream oh, that's supposed to happen yeah <laughs> yeah no, i've been, been watching the metropolis project very closely just because it's the closest thing i've ever seen to making that the um if we had the room for it um so one of the printers that we have here we have this one flatbed giant uv printer that has a build bed of uh five by ten feet feet so you could throw an entire sheet of plywood in there and put full color graphics on it and do other things nice. and, then, and then um i did the math so arasaka tower at 32 millimeters should be about 26 foot high yeah. yeah. And there is enough room in Gen Con for it. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> that might get me to go to Gen Con. Well, are you doing the, the 2077 version of the tower or the 2020 with the double tower? Well, I, go, I did the double tower. That's yeah. the iconic one in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or maybe we'll just bring all cows because. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was surprised at how well the cows are uh, are loved by the community. I, I laughed at that because, um, you know, the idea of that came from, you know, in 2077, you got the brain dance where you're doing the one detective thing and you're going into the, to the yeah. guy's head. The real the dark one. <laughs> yep. So I'm sitting there doing that and going all the way through. And then we were, as we always do, get sidetracked in the middle of the day and we're talking about everything except for work. And... We start talking, we're talking about the cows and, and the gas mask and start talking about World War One and the horses and everything else. And then somewhere along the line, the cow level from Diablo popped up. And we're like, oh, yeah, this has to be a thing. So we did it as a joke. And then we gave it such stats that it should never be on a table because it's it's <laughs> dumb. You shouldn't yeah. do that. And but now it's a thing. And. I, I want to take it to the next level for some reason. <laughs> of course. Um, are there plans to add more ve vehicles in the future, like cars or 
or other aspects, yeah, whether yeah. they're minis so, or STLs? So, yeah, so the big the big part of this is um, tooling's expensive um, and not everybody has 3D printers yet. It's coming. Um, but so what we're trying to do right now is I really wanted to get an AV made. So that's what this one's about. Um, we had we had some bikes that we were working on already. So we thought about the bikes and we were thinking about the nomads and what that might end up being. So we focused on that this time around. With that said, though, um, in the background, there are there's a there's a there's a semi floating around that people have, have noticed. There are there's a truck that people have noticed. There are um, we have containers. So how do you move the containers around? Well, you need wheels to hook to the bottom of the containers. You need those to be able to hooked up. Um, Mike has talked about land trains and what does you know what does um, you know five containers being dragged down the highway by by nomads from point A to point B look like with the big cow catcher on the front yeah. and this and these mm. sort of things. So um, and if you're going to do like that, that, then how do you play on that? And to play on a speeding land train, it's no different than playing on a ship, really. In that, if you fall off, you're dead. Um, essentially unless you can manage to get back on uh, the house rules we've been using for the container ship is that when you fall over the side um every single time there's an action you drift back green <laughs> nice so if you're able to get back to the side of the boat before it drifts away from you maybe but most people die well most and people... that is why reach is so important and you don't want to get close to guys that have more strength than you yeah you right you if you're if you're playing on the container ship, I recommend the grappling hook. It will save your bacon. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, so um, at our last show, um, when we were waiting for uh, Jay Gray to join us, um, we were kind of doing a bit of a review of the Kickstarter. Uh, and one of the things that both me and Derek agreed was that there needs to be a punk knot um, eventually yeah. from you guys. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. You know what a punk knot is from the yes. yes, so that's the thing that we were thinking that uh yeah, needs to be uh on your itinerary is like a configurable punk knot that you can like plug and play different weapons as a gang like you know builds it out like a like a bus, but you can trade out the wheels for vector thrust and uh or add cow catchers to the front like you said and barbed wire around the side we we are very much just starting <laughs> with everything we're doing and you know what is one of the things that i love about this community too and i love being able to interact with everybody directly i'm pretty active in the discord um just as far as i'm usually trolling around in there and when i get pinged constantly by guys in the office saying hey check this out check this out check this out um but you know we are paying attention and if people say something is cool we never discount anything right off the get-go we always take a look at it and see if it's viable and if it's cool and then usually max like oh this would be easy we'll take a card you do this blah, blah, blah. next thing you know you've got it all worked out and then he gives it to one of his uh play test groups the next thing you know, it's a thing. So uh, you'd be surprised how quickly we can develop something when uh, enough enough people get excited about it. Yeah. The engine is also really, really well built for balance. Like a, a lot of times you might look at something and think it's not very well balanced, but the minute you see it in play, the reaction system itself interlaces the turn so much that it, it immediately allows people to respond to stuff so i was it's easy I to was make those fun crazy things yeah i was talking to will before you guys joined us and i was just basically talking about you know the reaction rules and i was like you know i almost like these more than the actual combat rules for red like they, they're just very intuitive like it looks really, it looks really complicated at first, but once you start doing it, it's it's really smooth. I, I, what I like about it is the 
it is once you get your head around the concept and how it works the flow is really really fast and it goes back back and forth between things but um but what it doesn't have that I will give to um, Red all day long is exploding dice. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exploding dice. Play, play, playing with uh, with my buddy Beast, um, the Paladin character with yep. the beard, uh, the guy in Team Monster, when he's running around, it's he cracks me up. He's like, <laughs> "Yep, exploding dice." Seventeen. Uh, exploding dice are nice. Like that, it, it's everybody. Beautiful. Everybody really? likes it. Uh, okay. Big numbers. Yeah. No whammies. There's big numbers. Yeah. Well, everyone likes it when you get the exploding <laughs> dice. Everyone likes it when the other guy gets the exploding dice. Yeah, those are the whammies. Yeah, I mean, no, we don't like that. That's when they're cheating. That's clearly cheating. Yeah, they're 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 being underhanded and dirty. Yeah, that's it. shenanigans. I call shenanigans. Shenanigans. Well, that's kind of like the the quick quick hacks in uh, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, and I know a lot of the tabletop players want the quick hacks and you know into the role playing. They game. want them until they're used against them. Yeah, I don't know. I love the architecture system with the elevator. Yeah, it allows me to when I'm running uh, red, it allows my net runner to be a part of the actual infiltration slash exfiltration. It allows it allows me to put in stuff. That kind of unlocks to make their life easier as the hacker descends lower they suddenly start getting answers for things they didn't have so like maybe my players will get creative early on and come up with something fun but if they don't it's like oh great now i've got control of the cameras is what we're looking for on what floor is it on you know like like they get to you know the game gets easier as the net runner goes along but at the same time they're in danger the whole time so you yeah. have to keep the pressure on i really like red's elevator system it uh, it lends itself to the, their networking yeah, system is is good my point was that you know quick hacks from the computer game um a lot of people wanted to bring those in however if if v was able to be quick hacked with grenade and suicide and you know you, and i think there is no a one like, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no one, one would, would like, like quick hats like, anymore you know yeah <laughs> you get quick hacked oh that would suck so um, but that's kind of one of those things that works in a computer game that doesn't always translate well into a tabletop role-playing game or even to, you know, a tabletop skirmish game. I mean, there are rules like that even in the tabletop game. Like, every player out there loves luck. But if you start giving the bad guys luck and have them use <laughs> it, suddenly it's not such a happy time. Yeah. Yeah. That's the case, though, in every role-playing game. I can think of a dozen. I play a lot of Pathfinder. I can think of a lot of a dozen yeah. tricks that my players are always doing. Like, if I put that on one NPC, you guys would be so mad. <laughs> just just crying mad. Just throwing things across the floor and flipping the table mad. Just, Everybody yeah. wants a rocket launcher until the enemy gets a rocket launcher. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Not well, to take that's it... That's why like, Tootol has a rocket launcher. I was going to say, <laughs> you're... Your character has one, right? Yep. And a rocket jump ability. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Those are even cooler, yeah. And I, I was so annoyed when I lost a game because my opponent did a rocket jump across a gap and was able to get to an objective. He just used too tall to rocket. And I'm like, well, I want to nerf him, but I can't because it's my boss's character. <laughs> Don't be touching too tall. Come on. <laughs> so is that a call back to Doom, or? Uh... I I think it's a yeah it's a uh, it's a Doom reference I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um. It's so funny though, the pose the pose from that though for that character was from um, Person of Interest. Oh, when, I remember that. Oh, good show. Yeah, and basically there was the scene where the guy was carrying the fifty cal down the middle of the street and he was just kind of carrying it like a pole over his shoulder as he was walking <laughs> down the middle of the road. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, swap that. Swapped up the 50 cal for a rocket launcher. That'd be awesome. That's what we ended up doing. So, and then that was the character I, I played. But even then, when we did it, it's you know the character wasn't near as flushed out as it was until after we ended up playing the game. So, so that was that was a lot of fun. And then uh, the other character I really like from Team Monster is is Knox. 
I really like that character a lot. And uh, Nora Abraham, who's who is the uh, actress doing that for us, she's in the um, the uh, Acquisitions the Incorporated. Game. Yeah. Yeah, and she and she's great, man. She she does all kinds of stuff. She's she's a wonderful person. Yeah, I've and been she is, as diehard gamers. They come. I've been following her on uh, the Glass Cannon Network uh, with yeah, Call of Cthulhu. Incorporated Penny Arcade's about to do a cyberpunk thing. They and have. It's, now. it's, it's <laughs> they're actually broadcasting right now as we talk. Whoa. So, we yeah, we were in competition I, with them. I learned that Adam Smasher was into country music. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, like, that's, what? That's amazing. <laughs> that that makes more sense than anything else I've ever heard about Adam Smasher in my life. I, I, I thought I, I thought Audrey was joking about it. She's like, no, no, it was in the thing. I'm like, yeah. show me. And I'm like, wow. It's canon now. Now I can. I mean, only, I, I just yeah. want to see like a an Adam Smasher highlight reel set to nine to five by Dolly Parton. But yeah, I also. Uh, I, I mean, I can just imagine the seven foot tall metal monstrosity coming into the building with like boot scoot boogie playing over the speakers. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Jesus. It's what Machiko found uh, nice in him. <laughs> uh, but, him. Him having a body that looks like Elvis suddenly makes much more sense. A blonde he Elvis. Look like that. Everybody was a child once. There's he was still a monster when he was a child. We've talked to Benjamin Wright about him. <laughs> um, so I know you guys had a, a pamphlet about your uh, 2024 stuff uh, and what's coming out with the, the Judge's Handbook, which I think you guys just produced a, a beta version of it. Yeah, I, th I think they just put the link out today. Today or yesterday? Yeah, it just went out. Um, that was um, basically what the judge's rule book is, is um, all of the same Q&A that seems to pop up all the time. We kind of put that up in there, but we also wanted this massive reference of just every single card in the game that we currently have. I had no idea we had this many cards. And when the guys That's are coming back to me and they're like, oh, the page count right now is like 100 and something. I'm like, what? I have no idea it got that big because, you know, it's it's always around and you just don't, until you see it in a pile, you don't realize how much you've really done. And in the amount of time that we've been working on this, which has only been, what, three years, three and a half years, there's yep. a huge amount of stuff that we've put out already. Yeah. And according so to I'm, this, I mean, the... yeah. yeah, it's been like four years since you guys started putting out miniatures for Cyberpunk. And I mean, I remember it started out, you guys had like a dozen or so, and now there's hundreds of them. Yeah, there's well, um, yeah, there's a lot. Which is, is there a favorite that you guys have sculpted that like, this is, this is the pinnacle or, uh, of the licensed characters, the, the pre-existing characters, was there a favorite of those that you got to sculpt? My, my problem is, is that I personally you know, I can't sculpt to save my life. Now, if you want me to cat an engine, I can do that in a heartbeat. But if you ask me to make a, uh, a person that doesn't look like a stick figure, that's really, really hard for me. So <laughs> it's every every time I watch Charles or Constantine or one of these guys and they submit one of the miniatures in, I'm always blown away at how cool they look. And my my favorite miniature, honestly is usually the newest one that gets stuck in front of me because I, mean, it blows me away because i just i'm like oh this is so good and, and then what i love about the stuff we're doing now is you look at it and there's enough out there that oh i want to put this with this guy or i want to do that and what i'm i'm having a lot of fun with the um there's a lot of people that are kit bashing this stuff now um and i know a lot of a lot of the one of the things when you're you're making figures and you're putting stuff together is um how much work do you want to not force but how much effort do you want someone to spend putting the miniature together we got a lot of figures that are you know single pose single piece models that are what they are um then we have other ones where we wanted to do a, 
we wanted to be more creative about the pose, but you couldn't get it out of the mold. It, it just wouldn't come out of the mold. So what we've tried to do is any place that we are essentially forcing somebody, somebody to glue something together because we want it to be a little more dynamic about the pose, but in order to do that and to get out of the mold, we had to cut a piece off. We're trying to add something else to it or make it so that that can be a piece of something else down the road. Um, I don't like making single, single things that can't be used for other stuff. So sometimes you'll see, you know, a lot of our figures just have neck holes where you can drop in a head. We've got, you know, yeah. tons of heads now that let people mix and match and change things up to kind of make it look like whatever they want it to do. We have some that have, you know, the, the upper torso is different from the lower torso. But we've got some where we break the arm in one place. Um, one of the things about um, casting and doing stuff is it's almost impossible to hide a scene when you take two miniatures and you know, two pieces of something to put it together. So if you're going to have a scene, you want to make it a feature. And once you start getting into it, you start realizing it's like, you know, for a D and D figure or something, if you're going to make somebody swap a weapon or something like that, it's funny how there's a, there's always a cuff on the sleeve or there's always a piece of fur or, or a bandana someplace that lets you kind of cover it up. It. Yeah, cover up that seam because it can't disappear. So do something that you can kind of put back into it. And a then, lot of the techniques John is talking about right now can be seen on that beautiful moment figure uh, that we just that with uh, Rebecca and Adam Smasher, like. That's just a great example of all these. Well, it's cool. Oh, about where, that. Uh, where Adam yeah. Smasher's trying on his new pair of shoes. <laughs> yes, pretty much. But but when you look at that figure when it goes through, it's um, you know the we basically broke it broke it at the at the just below the ribs, and there's all kinds of detail there so it can go together. Um, the the arms on the front where the weapon had to be in order to make that all go together be able to come out of a mold. Um, he's got those essentially shoulder pads on that lets us hide things under the seam there, and that gave us the room to put the to put the rock his rocket launcher on his shoulder and plug that into the back. The actual the um, the the clever bit that I think we did for this was how we um, got Adam balanced up there, and we we Charles sculpted the model. We actually ran. Um, we actually ran some um, weight analysis on the model itself in the software to get the balancing point right. And we balanced the, the weapons over the top of the two. And we what we did is we took um, the, the rifle that Becca was pointing upward and we essentially made that the, the male feature that kind of stuck up. And then we made the barrel on the end of Adam Smasher's gun a little bit wider. So. You don't have to glue it. You can literally take the one mile, stick it on top, and it will balance there perfectly. Nice. And you just put it on, and, and it works out great, and you're you're good to go. And um, yeah, as long as you orient it right, they counterbalance each other, and it stands up nice and strong. And it's pretty. It's it's pretty. It good makes there. it function as both an optional Rebecca or Adam Smasher feature. <laughs> nice. Uh, yep. <clears throat> so we got about. 20 minutes or, or less um, to our show. Um, and going back to that flyer about what's upcoming with uh, 2024, uh, there's four new uh, box sets for Maelstrom, um, Tiger Claw, Arasaka, and Danger Gal. Is there an expected release date for those boxes, or they've kind of been side rail because of all the other the two big things that you guys have just uh, produced. Well, um, I, I think we're, we're targeting right around Gen Con. Okay. For this stuff. Um, and don't hold me to the, 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 the pro the, the problem with running a game company is we are, we are about 18 months ahead. So when you're telling me what's coming out, I'm already thinking about next year. <laughs> Well, I'm having to go back to see or what what are we coming up with? I'm not sure. Um so but if it's if it's in the sales flyer and it's and it's being solicited right now as things that we're working on, chances are we're targeting Gen Con for it. Okay. 
Yeah, because the, the other thing is you mentioned uh, also some new gangs that you guys are, are bringing in and wasn't sure exactly when when we could uh, expect, you know, those coming in. And I think yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not going to not going to throw throw dates on any of that. Right. And generally what we have is um, for some of the future planning stuff, we we usually do one or two test figures early. To kind of get the look and make sure everybody's happy with the way things are, are going with that and then um, once once everybody signs off on on those those test figures and then we expand the range on it um and then i know mac is constantly working on he's constantly doing rule updates for things a lot of times too we'll put out rules um knowing they're going to be assigned to certain characters but we won't put the name of those characters in the rules for the testing. It's more of just to see how the math works. Right. And then things, that makes will, sense. Then things will be assigned and tweaked later on. So that was you know, especially true with vehicles, right? We, we established yeah. some baselines and build from there. Exactly. So it's like, you know, what, what does, what does a Ford pickup truck look like? Mm -hmm. and you kind of run with that just because it's basic and you're like, all right, how cheap can we make that? So it, everything is still in line all right now let's make it cool well now you gotta start okay. adding points to it how do you put that cow catcher out in front how do you mount a machine gun in the back you know exactly. all, the, all, the good stuff. all important how do you make it look cyberpunk exactly <clears throat> yeah so uh, i know mac you answered one of my questions when i posted on your discord about the uh wild things gang and how they kind of look uh, like uh 2077's uh animals um but there's no connection, <laughs> at least. I, I do not believe there to be a direct, like, descendancy between the two, no. Uh, wild things are, uh, at least, as as far as I've been told, they are a uh, enforcer gang. They, they do a lot of, you know, boxing tournaments, strongman tournaments, weirder, made-up sports stuff just for fun in underground kind of situations. But mostly what they do is get hired out to uh, work protection for locations like bars and stuff like that. Kind of like the animals. A lot of, a lot of that <laughs> stuff, too. I, I don't want you guys to think that we're, we're inventing a lot of this. Yeah. Some of the stuff is fun. We do. Uh, we definitely expand on things when they let us. Because sometimes there's a name and an icon. And that's about all that exists for something. And then we kind of get to run with it. Um all of that sort of stuff, um, you know, Jay Gray is kind of the, the keeper of the of the knowledge. And right. we always reference him all the time. And between him and he, he'll have chats with Mike and I'll have chats with Mike. And all of that stuff, that comes from those guys. Got and they, they put us on the path and then they let us run with it. And then we'll come up with ideas, we'll show it back, and they'll be like, yeah, that looks great, or no, that's completely wrong. Do it this way. And we're like, oh. <laughs> and, and that happens a lot. Believe me, it is it is rarely right the first time we do anything. I, I, um, I think Jay Gray just has an auto reply to me with, uh, that guy wasn't born yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, Jay's been on the show a couple of times now, and uh, he's always he's always good fun. He's a he's a lot more closed lip about future products than you guys. So, oh man, <laughs> gotta pry it, pry it out. But, but yeah. that, that's important too because I, I think there's a, there's always conversations going on in the background about different stuff. But you know, it's there's also things being worked on by CD, and there's you you got to be careful. Yeah, you can't just yeah. start throwing things out there. Be, or otherwise, something gets. <laughs> Arnold, and then that's no fun for him. Yeah. He's got a lot more king in the kingdom he has to be mindful of. Right. Yeah, and between I... CDPR, Trigger, and and Artal Sorian, the, the rights issues make make revealing anything that isn't set in stone yet a much more delicate procedure. Yeah, and I don't yeah, think a lot so... of people understand the complexity around, you know, that whole interaction. Um, because yeah, they just it's, assume it's that, you know, Mike, <laughs> Mike can make law at any time, and then, eh, you can make law in certain areas, but not all. Um, you say that he might can do anything. <laughs> he can, especially <laughs> that voice, man. The truth, yeah. <laughs> um, Smooth like butter. But yeah, I, I also want to. I would never for a moment tell Mike he couldn't do something. <laughs> 
but I just wanted I want to, to be uh, there when that happens. So yeah. Let me know when you do that. Just want to tell the audience <laughs> that um, the two other factions besides the Wild Things is the Piranhas and Sixth Street are uh, supposedly on the slate to be uh, produced. Yeah, those are hybrid. The Piranhas are a hybrid Zoner uh, Bozo gang, and Sixth Street are a Zoner Lawman. Yeah, it, it, it's it still blows me away sometimes when I'm I'm researching things online, and you know, like most of us, you know, you Google it, you see what pops up, and then you end up in the in the wiki somewhere, <laughs> yeah, diving through. And a lot of the stuff that's in the wiki is real, but then there's also a lot of fan base stuff. Yeah, so you got to be really careful to. Is it real? Is it not real? And then it always it always makes me chuckle when I see our stuff in there. I'm like, yeah, we really are helping grow all of this. So yeah, you're part of the official canon now. Yeah, it's 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 very cool. Yeah, and that's that's Literally. the one thing that I think with our show that we've we've loved is talking to the original writers. You know, like um, Benjamin Wright Benjamin talking Wright. about uh, Adam Smasher and how that kind of developed. Um, Ed Baum Ed with Rach Rach Bartmos. Um, and just how how that character evolved out of his mind. Um, it's, it's really Will cool. Moss with the uh, Forlorn Hope guys. Well, Forlorn Hope and all the mega corporations, right? I mean, he based yeah. Arasaka off of uh, uh, was it Zero or Samurai novel? I forget uh, the novel's I think he's name. Count Zero. No, so so there was a so Arasaka was based off of or. Saburo is based off of a uh, World War II pilot who wrote a novel. I think it was called Samurai. Um, no, it, no, that was called Zero. That was yeah. Zero, yeah. Um, okay. Just things like that. Um, so I guess uh, my other question is, are there going to be uh, plans for more minis for the tabletop game, or is it just you guys are more concentrated on doing uh, Combat Zone? going forward i mean one is the other <laughs> everything we make for combat zone can be used in the role-playing game uh one of the reasons we we want to put things together in gang packs for instance is it becomes a lot easier for your gm to add say you know those tiger claws to his repertoire if they're the bad guys for instance uh by just buying that gang right it immediately gives your gm a lot of options uh, that's why we did the gonk packs uh, the way we did. That's why they feature so heavily in the in the miniatures game, is so that GMs can still find our uh, entire product line approachable when it comes to building out their miniatures game collection. Right. And, and I know one one of the things that we are going to do with with the um, with the excitement around the the standups that we're working on, um, we're we're going to work through the entire range, so all of those will be available. To oh, really? Yeah, it's, it takes a while, so it's not something we can do overnight. But um, even the corpse minis, like the dead bodies. Oh, did you see the new ones we just showed off? Yeah, and your Kickstarter. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Look at the Kickstarter. I think I, yeah, I, I asked Charles. I said, "Can you make me a couple of dead bodies?" And the next <laughs> thing I know, he's like, "Work through all the gangs." And I was like, "Oh, okay." I guess yeah, I'm there's nine or dead bodies, twelve of them. So Full dozen. It's crazy. I mean, it makes so much sense to have dead body minis that I'm surprised that it wasn't a bigger thing before now. Yeah. And and you can do a lot with those too, which is fun. the the other yeah. The other idea that we've been bouncing around with a little bit. So imagine, if you will, you are a net runner in combat zone, right? And you go and you plug yourself into a terminal someplace. Now imagine your figure is now bound to that terminal and can't be moved anywhere. So now your avatar is a stand-up of something fun. And now that can move around freely on the table and interact differently with the current universe that's there. Oh, that's differently idea. than what you can do as an actual miniature. Suddenly you have your cyber teddy bear running around as your acrylic version of your, your cyber self. Yeah, that, that's ignoring that's walls, but it's a great idea. idea. So that that's in the works too. 
cool. Yeah, yeah. so the, the one thing that I think uh, Derek would love to see more of are, are nomads. Um, yeah, love nomads. <laughs> Definitely on my radar. Yeah, no, that's, that is absolutely being... We're deep diving into that right now. We actually just got given a whole bunch of um, assets that we are are working our way through to see see what we're doing. Um, it's and, all yeah. The um, the avocados are the uh, first direction we're running in seriousness. Oh yeah, you guys. <laughs> what I think the things that's really important to get right for our game is the vehicle rules, which is what makes this current Kickstarter so important. Because that's gonna make doing nomads right a pop, yeah. right? Because you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get too tall as a nomad. I mean, I wonder yeah. how much I can get for a kidney these days. <laughs> but you know, but after after the collapse of everything, the, the the real guys that are doing all the logistics and the commerce, it's 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 being broken up amongst the different nomad factions. Yeah, yeah. they're they're the backbone of the new American society. Yep, and that was that was a really cool conversation Mike had with me when we were talking about Too Tall, and I'm like, you know, so if I was a merchant marine and I was a captain, what would I be? And he went into the whole storyline and what I'd be doing and where I came from and why it's cool and what's going on, and I just like, oh yeah, this is definitely my character, <laughs> and we're gonna take that and run with it. Well, um... That's so very exciting we're almost done do you guys have any questions for us i keep doing what you're doing man this, yeah. this is fun yeah i mean um both derek and i have had uh websites for cyberpunk 2020 since the late 90s early 2000s um and kind of been been off and on <laughs> with the game but uh now that you know we, we saw how Mike has come back to his uh, wonderful child and how um, everyone seems to be taking the, the property and just expanding on it is just great for, for like old time fans like us to see uh, how much Isn't love you guys right they're getting. He's a cyberpunk fan right now, you know? Yeah. It really, really is. Um, it's, it's the neon age. It's, it's a magical, magical neon age. I like that. In, in some ways, though, do you feel like Oh, uh, now it's mainstream. It used to be mainstream. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Just like, you know, when I got into anime, the only way to get it was, like, 12th generation bootlegs at, at oh, conventions. Yeah. These young whippersnappers don't know how good they have. <laughs> yeah. They're crunchy rolls. Ugh. Yeah, playing it on, on, like, actual network television. Like, what the hell? Yeah. Or, or um, even just gaming in general, right? I mean, I remember, like, yeah. we were talking about earlier, you know, being a D&D &D fan, you were not in the mainstream. <laughs> you were not liked. I mean, sometimes you were so far out of the mainstream that there was violence involved, especially towards, the, like, in the Satanic Panic era. Yeah. Like, you had to keep that shit under wraps. It's funny. Uh, my first DM was, a Southern ba was my Southern ba Baptist pastor in the middle of the Satanic Panic. Which is funny, because in the middle of that, there's this guy going, well, I don't know, let me read the books and find out. Oh, no, this looks like fun, let me run it for the boys. <laughs> exactly. Right? And you'd expect the exact yeah. opposite of him. Yeah. When I first started... I'm going to say D&D was... Uh, but fuck Egypt. Jeez. <laughs> Oklahoma. <laughs> just, the school had a total of 56 people in it, and it was kindergarten through seventh grade. Just... No. And that's where I learned to play Dungeons and Dragons. I I got the I got the source book and I was getting and I had my you know my crayons and my dice and I was filling in the thing and kind of learning all this. And my mom got all nervous about it, and she took me to see the father at church. And he's like, you know, it's make believe, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, he's good. <laughs> Beautiful. And yeah, so it was. And after that, it was. My mom's like, "All right, so what is this?" I mean, I remember. I remember a couple of times where she ran me through a made-up dungeon. Oh, nice! Because nice. You have nobody to play with. I'll run you through it. I'm like, cool. So. Yeah, yeah. my parents bought me tons of RPG stuff. I I don't know I don't know why they kept doing it because I wasn't playing RPGs at the time. Um, but yeah, they bought me like the entirety of the Robotech books. Did you have the Palladium uh, books? 
All the Palladium books, all the yeah, Palladium Robotech books. All the weapons. I just love the source books. Those were awesome. Yeah, absolutely. They were like art books before I knew what art books were. I remember. Uh, the Marvel Phase Rip books. Yep. I remember finding those Battletech uh, schematic books in the back of a Walden's at the mall. Oh, yeah. Was just... I was a big guy. My, my tiny fan. teenage brain couldn't handle it. Yeah. Well, um, I got to say, I, I appreciate both of you guys joining us. Um, I know it was, we only thought Mac was going to be joining us, but John, thank you for uh, joining us and um, sharing, uh, you know, various topics and uh, uh, combat zone. And um, you, you can you can thank Audrey; she shamed me into it. Oh. <laughs> I will thank her specifically. Um, so we're just going to do our rollout. Um, if you want to stick around and talk to us a little bit after the show, you can. Um, but we're just going to do our closing, and then uh, we can uh, end it there. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, hopefully it was very informative. Um, I love talking to these guys. Uh, you can check me out on my site, which is uh, cybersmiley.net. Um, I have a bunch of uh, Cyberpunk 2020 utilities as well as Cyberpunk Red uh, programs that you can use to help uh, uh, improve your gameplay. Um, I have my own server, or Discord server, as well as I hang out over on uh, Cyberpunk Uncensored server uh, for Discord, as well as our, 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 our show's channel is also there. So if you have any questions for us, please do. I lurk on a lot of Cyberpunk um, discords as well as um, Monster Fight Club's Discord. And by the way, go check that out um, if you're looking for any Combat Zone or Witcher or uh, Borderlands stuff. Um, also, I hang out on the various Cyberpunk uh, and, and Combat Zone uh, Reddit threads. I am Wisdom Triple Zero. My name is Derek Bernier. I run Data Fortress 2020 since 1996 it's the largest most comprehensive cyberpunk 2020 site on the planet um i can be reached on facebook via the uh cyberpunk 2020 group and the data fortress 2020 group uh, i'm also on the cyber nation uncensored group um you can find me lurking on reddit as well as some of the discords for cyberpunk um, we absolutely love to hear from any of you with your comments, suggestions, criticisms, complaints, uh, anything. Basically, we just like hearing from people. Um, anything to make the show better. <laughs> uh, again, we'd like to thank uh, John Kovaleski and Mac Martin for joining us today from Monster Fight Club, um, as well as Audrey for making it happen. Yes. Um, We'd like to thank Rob Mulligan and Cybernation Uncensored for hosting us. Uh, and we hope to uh, see you again in, uh, what's, what's the next date, Will? First Wednesday of July. I think it's the second or maybe the third. Yeah. Uh, so, till then. Thank you much. Cyber Nation on Sensor.